Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our latest installment of Espresso with Carlo. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, series going on here uh, with um, leading candidates for controller and for mayor, and it's been really exciting so far. And stay tuned for some big announcements on uh, the rest of the mayoral field in the coming weeks. Let me let me begin by saying hello and. Are, we are really, I think, on the way back to uh, back to living. And it's been a tough year, almost a year, but I know that our industry continues to make great strides and really move forward together. Let me thank our hosts for <coughs> for Espresso with Carlo, Bravo, GSI, Langen, Siame, and STV. Thank you to these five amazing companies who are creating jobs and helping keep our economy afloat. Today we are joined by Zach Iskell, who is uh, one of the candidates for New York City Controller. Zach is a New Yorker, um, a US Marine, having served two tours in Iraq from 2001 to 2007. Um, he has been really an advocate on so many levels. He founded the Headstrong Project in 2012, a nonprofit that offers free mental health care. He founded Higher Purpose in 2014, a platform to aid veterans and Gold Star families in finding employment. He served as deputy director at the Javits Medical Center to aid in the COVID-19 crisis, where they treated over 1,000 patients. Uh, pretty amazing. Um, Zach is an advocate for uh, resisting bureaucracy, supporting community partners, ensuring quality health care, and supporting businesses to create jobs. He is an advocate for reimagining policy, policing by prioritizing accountability, tackling homelessness by finding affordable housing, and of course, something we all talk about, improving the city's transportation systems. I know we will hear a lot about Zach. Uh, he lives in Manhattan with his wife, their four children, and their three rescue dogs. Uh, interesting to note, his grandfather worked at the Department of Sanitation, and his mom was a teacher. So Zach, welcome to Espresso with Carlo. It's great to see you. It is great to be here. Thanks so much for having me, and uh, looking forward to the conversation today. Before we, we jump in, Zach, tell us a little bit about you and, and why you're running for controller and, and whatever you want to tell us. Yeah. So number one, uh, I mean, I think, I think you said most of it. I'm a, a husband and a dad. I've got four wonderful kids who were raising here in New York City, three rescue dogs, who you were probably going to hear interrupt uh, this conversation at some point during our chat. Uh, last 10 years, uh, since I got out of the Marine Corps, I've built a number of businesses uh, I've helped tens of thousands of people transition into new careers. Uh, as you mentioned, I helped lead the turnaround of Javits Medical Center, uh, walked in there as a volunteer on March 27th, uh, 28 federal, state, and city agencies, some of the best people I've worked with in my life. Uh, a lot of them weren't working well together. A couple of days later, I got asked to step in as the deputy director and help lead the turnaround there. Um, I've also built a nonprofits, and so I really have a tremendous amount of management and executive experience. Uh, dating back to the Marine Corps. I was a Marine officer. I was in the infantry and special operations. I led troops through some of the heaviest combat of the Iraq war. Uh, and one of the reasons that I'm th I threw my hat into the comptroller's race is bottom line, I care a lot about New York City. I care about the future of the city as a father who's raising his children here. Um, but I also see the unmet potential of New York City. And I think that existed even before COVID. Uh, this is a city that spends 90, $95 billion a year. It's up from 67 billion uh, before de Blasio first took office. Um, and when you think about that amount of money, it's more than 48 or 50 states. It's almost as much as the next 15 or 20, I think, largest U.S. cities combined. And yet when you compare the services that we're getting, the education that our kids are receiving, how we've navigated this pandemic, our public transportation, uh, our homeless crisis, uh, New York City is not doing better than other places, and it should be. Uh, and as comptroller, you know, this is a job that your number one job is you're an independently elected official. You're supposed to hold the 
mayor and the city agencies accountable for doing their job. That is incredibly important in a time of fiscal uh, restraint. And even more importantly, I think that this is a job that can be used to really leverage uh, the position to help lead New York City's economic recovery, to bring businesses back, to bring jobs back, to get people back to work, uh, and to help address some of the underlying issues that are facing the city, like homelessness, crime, public safety, uh, our small businesses. So it's, I think it is, it's a position with, with broad th authorities and responsibilities that can really be used to help lead New York City's recovery. And I'm excited to, to take the reins uh, in that role. So and that all sounds amazing. Obviously, we, we never had a crisis like the one we're experiencing today. We've had different crises, right? We almost went bankrupt in the 70s and 9-11 and the economic crisis, so many things. But this one has been unique. And I think you mentioned that the controller really is in a unique position. Give us some of your ideas on how you would work with a new mayor, presumably a new uh, four out of five new borough presidents, maybe five, <laughs> yeah. um, 40-something new council members, a new speaker of the council. Turn around. Well, what first off, do, uh, yeah. What would you do to help the city move forward and, and get out of its fiscal crisis? Yeah. I mean, so first off, I hope I'd be able to be a partner for the new mayor, uh, for those borough presidents, not somebody who's antagonistic. I hope that it doesn't have to be that type of relationship. Maybe there are times where it needs to be antagonistic because you are holding the bureaucracy in check. Uh, but there's no shortage of, of ideas that we have for how we could use this position. So number one is, is I think we have to look at, um, you know, making sure that we're addressing some of the underlying issues like homelessness, right? Monday night, I went and walked through Penn Station late at night. Now I've taken the train back from DC late at night. There's always a few homeless people walking around Penn Station. But Penn Station has now been turned into a homeless uh, shelter. This is a city that spends $3 billion a year on homelessness. It's more than almost every major U.S. city combined. We're one of the only few places in the country that have seen an increase in homelessness, not a decrease, even though we've increased the amount of spending from $1 billion to $3 billion on homelessness. So as comptroller, I will make sure every single one of those dollars is going towards outcomes. When I ran a nonprofit, the Headstrong Project, it's one of the leading largest providers of mental health care for veterans. We take care of 800 to 1,000 veterans every single week, 85 cents of every dollar goes to, career, to, to care and to getting veterans better, not towards overhead. And we haven't lost a single veteran to suicide in nine years. So I know how to sort of look behind under the hood and make sure that city agencies are, are working effectively. I think there's also really big opportunities for using uh, the pension fund to make smart investments in New York City and in industries. Uh, to help bring jobs back, to help grow new industries here. I think that is incredibly important. There's some really interesting opportunities on that front, um, in particular ones that affect uh, the building trades uh, that we can get into. Um, I think also that there's a role for the comptroller to not only audit the past performance of agencies, but to look forward into the future and make sure that we're prepared for future crises, right? Are we prepared for the next pandemic? Are we prepared in every neighborhood for the effects of climate change, for flooding, for another superstorm Sandy? Um, are we prepared to get our kids back to school next year? I think there's a role that the comptroller can play to make sure the city is putting plans and resources in place to make sure we are able to weather uh, future storms or pandemics or whatever they may be in a way that we have not done in this past year. So I think there's a lot of ways that we can use the office to, uh, to help bring the city back and make sure we don't face something like this again. We agree. You know, one of one of our leading principles of our organization is rebuilding our infrastructure and really investing in robust capital budget and capital planning. Obviously, we learned in the 70s what happens when you don't invest in the capital of New York. Give us a sense of how you would use your office to help rebuild our infrastructure and, and really how you would work with the mayor and the council on this robust capital budget that we have. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So I'm not a politician. Um, you know, I've been in public service for, for two decades. Can you hear me okay? Did I lose you? You're still there, okay. Um, no, no, no worries. I just, I just wanted to make sure I still had you. Yes, yeah, so there's, um, you know, I'm not a politician. Uh, I have been in public service for two decades. I have an incredible amount of management experience. Uh, this is a job that is not a job for a legislator. It is a job for a manager. You have a team of 800 accountants, lawyers, engineers that you have to manage. 
Uh, and also, I think we need people who are capable of creative thinking in this position who will use the office to help lead New York City's economic recovery. So, you know, there's a number of ways that can be done. Um, number one is, is you look at something like Local Law 97, right? You got this local law to reduce uh, um, uh, emissions uh, from, I think it's something like every building with over 25,000 square feet. Uh, it's about 50,000 buildings. It's $20 billion capital overlay. There are some really interesting finance mechanisms that can be developed around energy savings. You can look at a great example is what they did at the Empire State Building. $30 million uh, additional capital overlay on building retrofits led to four or four and a half million dollars in energy savings a year. So there are interesting financial mechanisms that can be developed that I think the comptroller's office can take the lead on to help figure out how we fund that $20 billion in a way that is not going to bankrupt um, property owners uh, and is going to lead to a reduction in emissions so we can hit those, those roles. Also creating 100 to 150,000 jobs. Um, I think a lot of politicians often right now, they love to just pass the buck back to DC and say, you know, well, we, we need a federal bailout. We need money from the state. But there is so much that we can do just here in the city. Um, one is really when it comes to infrastructure, getting our hands around how big these issues are, right? Everything that we don't spend a dollar on fixing today, we know uh, those costs drastically in, increase into the future. Um, and so we really need to get a handle on that so we're no longer mortgaging our kids' future with uh, um, decrepit and decaying infrastructure. That's also a missed opportunity to create jobs and put people back to work. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, is one of the things I want to do with the office is, uh, you know, when somebody's um, uh, applying for a city contract um, or they are somebody that's managing our pension fund dollars, as comptroller, I want to know, before I sign that contract, I want to know what is their commitment to New York City? It could be in a one-page cover letter, right? I just want to know. What are they doing to invest in our communities? What are they doing to help solve some of these big problems in our city? Have they moved their offices you know, out of the city? Are they doubling down? Are they hiring people here? Uh, how are they using their philanthropy? How are their employees using their volunteerism? But we really got to figure out ways of galvanizing all of New York, the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector to start working together to solve these problems and not just pass the buck to the federal government or the state while well, we need their help. There's so much that we can do together as New Yorkers uh, here in the city. We love that. I think we're all, right now, especially, we are all invested in New York City. You know, the question moving forward is, how do we keep uh, jobs here? I think one of the things you've talked about and what I've read up on you is yeah. your desire to keep business here, attract new business, create new jobs. How do we do that given, given the state of New York? Yeah. Look, I, it, it's not easy, but I don't think it's rocket science, right? I mean, like, what is, what's the number one thing every single business needs? Great people, right? Every success I've had in my life has had nothing to do with me and everything to do with the people I had around me. And so one of the reasons so many businesses come to New York City is because New York City has the best talent in the world. So how do we market New York City as the best place for young people to come, for the best place for families to grow up in, uh, to raise their kids in? Like, you know, people need to feel safe. That's number one, whether it's from crime, whether it's from uh, the pandemic, no matter what the source is. Um, you know, number two, we've got to have uh, the city can't be boring. Right. I think there was a study that just showed uh, that came out today or yesterday that we've lost two thirds of our jobs in art and culture institutions. We've got to bring back those art and cultural institutions because a boring city is not going to attract world-class talent. Right. Um, and then the last thing is the city can't be antagonistic to business. I mean, I, I, was in a, I was in a comptroller's forum recently where one of the questions was actually about not how do we bring new industries here, not how we diversify industries here, but how do we, how do we displace Wall Street, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's Wall Street, you know, for better or for worse, it's a huge industry here. It employs a lot of people. There's a cottage industry of small businesses, of bodegas, of delis, of restaurants that, that rely on people working in the financial services industry, whether in Midtown or downtown. Um, we can't have leadership in this town that are antagonistic to business. We need to have leadership that understands that um, you know, it's businesses that employ people. It's businesses that provide the revenues that enable us to provide city services. 
Um, so I think all of those things need to happen. We agree. You know, uh, there, there were maybe 30 or 40 years ago, there was always that give and take between New York and New Jersey. And, you know, a company gets lured to New Jersey, they get tax breaks and they come back. You know what? Now they could leave and go to Florida or Arizona or Texas or North Carolina. And, you know, the more businesses, big, small or medium, continue to feel unwanted, unneeded, and that what they're yep. doing is relevant, they just won't be here. And yeah. with that is an erosion of a tax base, because how are we going to pay for affordable housing and, and all of the things we want to happen if we don't have this tax base? So It's a huge issue. I, you know, and I think there's also, I mean, I can't tell you the number of, um, you know, especially when you talk, talk to restaurants, small business owners, um, back in December, um, there was a toy store in the East village that was like our family's go-to spot. Right. And I hate to admit this in a public forum, but like we bribe our kids for good behavior. And it was, okay. dinosaur I have a five-year-old, right? so I know what that's. About. So you know it, right. So we bribe our kids for good behavior and it was always, we're going to go to go, we, you know, you're, if you're well-behaved, we're going to go to dinosaur Hill. If you're not, we're not going to go to dinosaur Hill. And I took my kid, my son, Wolf, uh, who was six at the time. He's almost seven now uh, to dinosaur Hill. And this, the, the, the shelves were empty. It was their last three days open. I, this was at the end of November, maybe early December. And I remember walking out and just thinking, who would open up a toy store in the East Village today? I hope somebody does. But when you think about the bureaucratic challenges, the regulations, the red tape, how expensive it is to run a business in New York City, how difficult the city makes it, um, it can't be that, it can't make that hard. The number of restaurant owners I've talked to have shut down their restaurants who have promised that they will never open up a restaurant in New York City again. It takes six, seven months to get a, a liquor license. You know, it takes often more time to get permits uh, than it does to actually build out a restaurant. There's something like 6,000 different rules and regulations they need to adhere to and something like 16 different agencies. Uh, all of that can be massively streamlined. I agree. It's it's almost like government oftentimes tries to keep you away as opposed to saying, come, come, we want to help. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, these some of these restaurant owners, I mean, if they were going to go establish a restaurant in Pittsburgh or, 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 you know, North Carolina, the mayor would actually meet with them if they were creating 24 or 30 jobs. Right. You know, they, they would be welcoming because they understand that they need those Absolutely. jobs in their communities. Absolutely. So let's talk about the Office of Controller. Yeah gritties of it. Uh, you know, uh, for our members, many times it's about being signed and, and money being flowed and, uh, you know, controller approving contracts. Um, it's also about many of our MWBE companies yep. who really rely on that. Give us a sense of some of your priorities as controller. In the office, what does it look like for you, the officer? Yeah. So it is a, it's a, it's the, the, the comptroller's office has a lot of responsibilities, right? And, and they primarily fall under two main buckets. Uh, number one being the oversight of city agencies, um, rooting out waste, fraud, abuse, and corruption, making sure that city agencies, city contractors, nonprofits doing a lot of work for the city are actually doing, doing their work. Number two is chairing the pension fund. That is a huge responsibility. Uh, one that I take very, very seriously uh, to make sure that the city is meeting its obligations and its responsibilities to the people that keep the city running and who have worked for the city in the past. Um, and then I think that there's these other roles that the comptroller can take on in helping lead the economic recovery of New York City and making sure the city is prepared for future pandemics, for climate change, um, for other natural and man-made disasters. Um, you know, and then there's also just sort of a lot of, of smaller roles. I mean, it's a big office, 800 accountants, lawyers, engineers, a budget of somewhere between 60 and 80 million a year. Um, and so one of the things that I would really want to do with that office is, is create a culture of accountability. Uh, you know, back in the day, uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, every year at the end of the fiscal year, used to walk across the river and hand a check back to, the, um, uh, to Congress. And the idea was being that the, the Marine Corps had done more with less. Um, I think similarly, we need to create that culture within city agencies. You know, we used to have the program to eliminate the gap. Agencies would be required to identify three to 5% in savings a year. Uh, I would do that within the Office of the Comptroller. Um, 
you know, I think that some of the investments and with city contracts, your question about that, uh, in a majority minority city, it is critically important that we increase the number of, of businesses doing business with the city that are owned by women and minorities. I think there are some great examples we can look at um, in the military and veterans community where veteran owned businesses have benefited immensely from different contracting practices, subcontractors, mentorship, um, training programs uh, to really sort of get, give it, create those pipelines um, where they can build those, get that experience and then become, you know, work their way up the, the contracting pipeline. I think that's critically important. I think in terms of the nonprofits that do a lot of the service work for our city's most vulnerable, there is so much that can be done to recognize good actors, to streamline the process for um, making sure they get paid on time and get paid for the services that they provide. Um, we're also rooting out bad actors. And we know that there's no shortage of some of these bad actors out there. Like there's this big New York Times story a couple of weeks ago about a, sorry about the, the dogs. Um, but um, there's a big story in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about a, a shelter provider up in the Bronx, $240 million contract, um, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that was being used. Um, the uh, Sorry, my son is coming right here. Yeah, buddy, come here. You want to come say hi? Um, um, but to really make sure that we're rooting out those bad actors and that the money that's being spent isn't going to waste, fraud, abuse, and corruption, isn't going to buy fancy cars, vacation homes, or in this case, uh, the shelter provider was actually sexually abusing women and paying for their silence. Uh, and the comptroller can do a big job of making sure that never happens again. I agree. One, one of your priorities in, in uh, I was reading one of your platforms was your, and you mentioned it earlier, the, the cutting of bureau bureaucracy and red tape and streamlining and finding savings. Do you have a little bit of more detail on that? Because that, that I think makes so much sense. Um, and, and business does that all the time. How does the city do that? Yeah. So there's a couple ways. So one is, you know, Often when we think about the comptroller, we think about the audit powers and it's sort of like, okay, as, as comptroller, I'm going to go audit this city agency. I'm going to see how much they spent and what the outcomes were. But I think one of the things that the comptroller can do is actually create benchmarks, right? So if we look at the way that we collect our trash in the city, we pay four times more to have our trash picked up than any other place in the, in the country, possibly the world. So why don't we go look around the world, do a study and an analysis to find out how are people doing this for less? How are they doing it more efficiently? Right? And let's create those benchmarks that we can now measure our progress against. And you can do that for any number of city services. So that's number one. Uh, number two is reinstating the program to eliminate the gap. Um, you know, the city right now or the comptroller's office has a grading program for diversity, how well city agencies do in hiring and in city contracts uh, in terms of hiring women, hiring minorities. I think we need a grading scale uh, a larger grading scale, the same one, similar that we have for restaurants, that grade agencies uh, based on their financial responsibility and the services that they're providing. Um, and having an annual report that comes out, you know, the way that we have a U.S. You know, News and World Report college rankings um, that we do for city agencies to really measure their effectiveness and setting the example that it's really incumbent upon city agencies to do more with less. Um, I think there's also some changes that can happen with the way we do budgeting in the city. Uh, New York City uses an incremental budgeting approach. So every year they look at projected revenues. Uh, they look at how much they spent. And if projected revenues are more than they spent, the city finds things to spend money on. If it's less than what they spent money on last year, they look for things that need to cut. Now, that's an easier budget system, but I think there are ways of using something more akin to a zero-based budget. Maybe not every year because it's a rigorous and onerous process but maybe every four years on a quadrennial basis where you build a budget from the background up, looking at what are the services we're being able to provide. Now, it might not be possible to get to that perfect zero-based budget, but doing that will help you really identify and laser in on what are the responsibilities of my agent, agency? What are the things that we need to be doing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to make sure we're meeting the needs and demands and responsibilities we have to, to people of this city? And how can we build a budget based off of that? So budgeting is one program to eliminate the gap. Benchmarking is another um, and setting the example. I think there's, there's no end to ways that we can find greater efficiencies in a $90, $95 billion budget. 
Agreed. We agree. So you're, uh, one of your statements has been you're not, a, you're not a legislator, right? You come from the private world, Navy, uh, veteran, uh, nonprofit leader, et cetera. Why is that important right now? You know, some people may say, well, don't you have to have been elected to something before you become controller? What makes you unique in this set? Um, so I don't think that's true. I don't think for a job like comptroller, you know, comptroller is an independently elected office. Uh, it's an executive position. So it's one that requires management experience and abilities. I think I'm the only one in the field that has managed anything near the scale of the comptroller's office. It's about 800 people. I've managed organizations of a few thousand. Um, so management is, is really important. It's also important because in the comptroller's office, um, you're responsible for auditing the performance of city agencies. I have government experience um, in and out of the military. You're responsible for working with businesses. I have a lot of business experience. I've worked with you know, hundreds of small, medium, large businesses um, and run a number of businesses. Uh, you also have to work alongside nonprofits uh, that are delivering a lot of city services. I've done that as well. Um, and so I think it's, uh, I think those skill sets make me uniquely qualified uh, for this job. Sometimes uh, errors of change need change agents. And, uh, it sounds like that's really what you're looking to be is someone to come in and really kind of shake the tree a little bit. Yeah, look, if things have been working for you in this city, there's plenty of people to vote for. <laughs> if you don't think the city is, is working as, as well as it could be, um, you know, if you think the city needs real leadership, if you think, you, you know, the city needs somebody who is, um, I mean, just look at the decisions that have been made by um, politicians over the last six, seven years, they've increased the amount of spending to, uh, by $20 billion a year. $20 billion a year, that's twice the budget of LA County. Um, and that amount of money, it's hard to know what we're getting for it. We certainly didn't become more prepared for this pandemic than any other place. We fared worse by any measure. Um, we certainly aren't prepared for dealing with homelessness and rising crime or bringing back businesses and industries. Um, we have a lot of people who have been using those dollars to get votes to support special interests. Um, you know, we need somebody who is going to make sure that those tax dollars are being spent not on special interests, not on political favors, um, but on serving the people of New York. And I think that also is something that requires a high degree of integrity. And I think I've proven throughout my career in and out of the Marine Corps, in and out of the nonprofit sector, in and out of the business community, even at the height of COVID, going to Javits Medical Center, um, building a field hospital, uh, that I have the integrity to do the job. Well, it sounds like you do. Uh, last question. Um, yeah. You know, the, the business community is clearly a, a very, very critical part of New York's history, its present and its future. Um, you know, when, when we almost went bankrupt in the 70s, it was business leaders and labor leaders that came together and really saved the city. Um, how, do we, how do we keep this tradition going? How do we ensure that the business community is at the table making decisions with our elected officials. Yeah, so apologize about the fire truck. As we come out of truck, a yeah. pandemic. Yeah, sorry about the fire truck going Don't outside worry. the, uh, the it's uh, New York window here. It is New York, that is for it's sure. Loud city. Um, in case, uh, so, you know, I think um, one of the things I've done throughout my career is uh, built consensus amongst people that, and groups that shouldn't often it's hard to build consensus amongst, right? At, at Javits Medical Center, we had 28 federal, state, and city agencies that we had to get on the same page, despite the politics outside the building. Going back to when I was a, a young platoon commander in Iraq, I had a company of Iraqi soldiers, 350, 400 Iraqi soldiers. Some were Sunni, some were Shia. Some of my Shia soldiers bore physical scars and missing appendages uh, that had been done to them by family members of some of my Sunni soldiers. So how do you get people to work together? Um, you know, it really starts with finding common cause and a common goal. There's no reason that every single New Yorker and every single community should not be realigned, should not be aligned around bringing the city back. That's something that happened in the 70s. You know, I love that you brought up it was the business community and labor that worked together, right? It was DC 13 that came to the table and really helped 
bail out New York City. And that story isn't really told. Um, and it's moments of crisis like this, like 9-11, like Hurricane Sandy that can bring this city together. Unfortunately, we have a political class that has demonstrated again and again that they have more to gain uh, by looking for political outcomes than real outcomes. And so I think the starting point is uh, next year, we're going to have a new mayor, a new comptroller. We're going to have 37 new city council members. Uh, we have to make sure we are electing people that care more about the real outcomes, that care more about, you know, bringing New York City to the great city that it can be, to making sure that we're serving the needs of all New Yorkers um, um, and putting politics aside. And I think if we just go back to politics as usual, if we just go back to people who have more to gain uh, by looking for people to blame and political outcomes, you know, it's going to be a much harder time back uh, than it needs to be. Yeah, great. Well, I think that is a, a great wrap up. Uh, I think, you know, no matter what happens in this race, um, I think clearly you are invested in your love of New York and ready for the future. I love your background. Thank you. New York. Um, I mean, look, this city has given me everything, you know, I mean, like so many people, right. I mean, there's this, this place is a refuge for people around the world. It has been since my family came here in the 1880s, uh, since my wife came here, escaping from that town, Boston, um, uh, those, to the terrible backwater Boston. town of Boston. Um, you know, my, my, Iraqi family, my translator from when I was my second deployment, his family settled here in 2007. This New York means something in the scope of history. Um, and it's certainly given my family everything. Um, and I think we as New Yorkers recognize how important this town is and we got to do everything to, uh, to fight to bring it back. We agree. Well, we're in this together and our members are uh, not ready to roll up their sleeves. They've been rolling up their sleeves. Uh, I love it ready to just just get New York on track and hopefully businesses will be back in in offices and restaurants will be open and we'll be back at events and we'll be able to do things like this back in person. So, I hope it I hope so. I hope we can do this uh you know next year. I hope we can do this in person. We will. We will. Zach, thank you very much. We thank you Carlo. And uh, we will see you at the next espresso with Carlo. And we'll be sending out an email shortly with the uh, our next guest. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.